Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. So glad to see y'all again. I've uh, been out for the last two weeks. I was out on the road with Brad Paisley. I was his uh, guest along with the great Nacho Banos. And we had a ton of fun talking Telecasters. And so much so that I asked Nacho if he would do a little comparison. And so this was filmed backstage in Zurich, Switzerland. And this is Nacho comparing his July 1953 Telecaster against an original broadcaster that another friend of mine, Olivier Uldry, that lives in Uldry, that lives in, uh, in Switzerland, he brought to the show for us to, uh, to look at. So from the patron saint of the Telecaster, Nacho Banos, you're going to get to see and hear a comparison between a 53 Tele and a broadcaster. My only regret on this was that, you know, we just had this little backstage area in one of the dressing rooms, and so we couldn't bring an amp in to, uh, you know, hear them, but you're going to get a really good comparison. Now, in thanks for Nacho doing this, uh, I'm going to give a plug for his book, the Pinecaster book. So this is a, uh, a four-volume set that is really the Bible for early Telecasters. Um, it tells this, the context of what was going on before the broadcaster, Telecaster Esquire, was developed, and it tells the entire process. It shows the prototypes, the guitars made of pine and such, and then there's all sorts of pictures of blackguards, and it's amazing for the photographs, for the stories that are told, for the context that's given of the time, and also for the uh, the drawings and little caricatures that you get from uh, Billy Gibbons. It's an amazing book, and you should go to pinecasterbook.com to check it out. All right, guys, here's Nacho. Well, hello, friends. You're not seeing my face. This is the face of Nacho Banos, and he has a broadcaster. And we also have my friend Olivier Uldry with lead music in Geneva, Did well. and, and so we are going to have a good time talking about Telecasters. We're going to let Nacho give, take us to school on the differences between this broadcaster that, uh, that is owned by Olivier, and then we're going to talk about this 53 telly that Olivier is holding, and uh, yeah, just kind of the evolution that these guitars uh, went through you know, in, a, in a brief period of time. Yes, sir. All right. Take it away, Nacho. So this is Olivier's guitar, and um, it's a, I have to say it's a beautiful guitar. It's number 0725. I'm, I'm guessing it's in November 1950 um, because of the, the way of the, the body, the finish, and um, the neck shape, and, uh, and the, um, you know, um, the, the looks of the of the of the finish in general um, it's a I would say it's a very light guitar for being a broadcaster I, I, I would I would be surprised if this thing is over seven pounds it will be most likely six and something mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um, the neck is a typical November um, guitar is more of a uh, medium D you know I would say it would be kind of like a 85, 86 on the, on the first fret. Uh, it's been very fretted, which is good news because you, you can play it and it's a great sound and a great playing instrument. Um, and it's, it's got the typical, you know, features of a, of a broadcaster. It's got um, what I'm, I'm, we haven't plugged it in, but I'm gonna assume this is a very powerful. Oh yeah, it is. Pickup. Mm -hmm. Um, the finish on this guitar is the typical November of 1950, which is a very um, brittle, um, and it's uh, it's thin, and it looks as if it doesn't have any real undercoat. So, if I were Olivier, I wouldn't play this guitar in Spain during the summertime because the sweat. <laughs> <laughs> would destroy the finish and you would be flaking all over uh, with your arm and you know uh, it would it wouldn't be blonde anymore 
uh, and some of the parts. But, you know, other than that, it's a, I think it's a beautiful condition. Um, it's got, you know, the tall knobs. Uh, I'm going to say it's, it's got the blend control. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, the, the, the guard, it won't have the diagonal route here. It's got brass saddles. And, um, you know, all of the screws are going to be uh, slot head. On the back, you see how uh, the furrows uh, are not aligned. So that means that they were uh, drilled from the top. And, you know, you can see some, it's a little funny. Uh, that's, that was a question I had for you because I've, uh, yeah, were they drilled from the bottom or the top? I, I guess they, they were they were drilled from 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 the top without having any any type of template. Okay. So each at a time. Yeah, each each one at yeah, a time. So the so it's not uh, aligned. If, yeah. if if you use kind of like a template, then they'll, they will all go. Makes know. it better. Yeah, and um, of course you know we have the the, the broadcaster decal and uh, and the um, the closed shell tuners with closing blocks, patent applied on the, on the back. Um, this is um, the pots, I'm going to guess, are uh, 304 stack pole. Uh, it would be 304 zero something uh, from 1950. It's got the, um, the early style uh, jack cup. And uh, yeah, you know, it's a uh, I think it's a perfect example of a 1950 broadcaster. It's a beautiful, I like, we were talking about this before, but I really like how the finish on this or the guitars is so complex because you get so many different colors in one, in one single place. You get, you know, some, some is darker, some is more butterscotchy, you know, some, you got different tones here, a different color here. You know, here's the total different. Um, on the sides, you know, you get the you know different shades. So it's very, very three dimensional looking. It's never a single color blonde uh, finish, which is why it's so hard to replicate these guitars. And when you get to the worn out areas like this, you always get that bare wood, and then a little lighter color, and then there starts to get dark butterscotch. It's a beautiful guitar. I'm in love. I'm sorry, Olivier. I think I'm going to take it home with me to Spain. Zurich <laughs> <laughs> is a nice place to stay. You know? I can stay here. I, oh. <laughs> it is it's a beautiful. it is a gorgeous guitar, it's, Nacho. It's a beautiful yeah. guitar. I'm so happy. It, yeah, it's a Thank it's you. a sickness. Oh yeah, it's a yeah. pleasure. I really appreciate it. Let's let's switch over to the uh, to the unless you have something else to say. Let's talk about the fifty three. I um I think it's uh, you know if you guys want to say something else or ask any questions, but I think it's just you know it's a perfect it's a perfect practice. And what do you what do you think is the sound difference with? The broad, in just in general, between the broadcaster pickup and the pickup that you that you would get in the fifty three. Well, the construction of this pickup is different because it's got it's got the thinner wire, and um, in order to get the body of a pickup, they would do more amounts. So it's a hotter pickup, and um, you know. Um, some you know we did the research on the magnets, and we found that most of the early guitars, instead of having a Nico 5s, would have the larger diameter um, Hoyne 19.5 on Nico 3s or on E 3s that don't have cobalt. Yeah. So that would give this sound a different quality. And the different quality would be, it would be a, a more kind of like, maybe a taut, darker sound. Uh, more powerful, you know, um, um, rounded off tone, maybe less um, twangy. Um, um, it, it, you know, it, it will still be, the, you know, a great black guard sound, but it will be um, um, different from, from a later black guard in that sense, because the, the construction of this pickup was, was a little different. 
I'm gonna switch to the 53. We're gonna have the, mm -hmm. the, the careful handoff. Let's yeah, let's make sure that. everyone's really careful. This is the most expensive trade. Oh. <laughs> and and this is Nacho's guitar. Okay. This is his 53. Yeah, this is I don't even know the cell number, but it's yeah. two, two, four, one. Yeah, this guitar is a 53. So to me, this is a like another perfect time for Fender is a uh, July 1953. That's which is, very specific. Which is very specific for this. This is the type of neck that everybody likes to say, like to uh, refer to as a baseball bat. But it's it's a large neck. I'm, 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 I don't remember this by heart, but I'm gonna guess this is over 90. Uh, 0.90 on the on the first fret, which may sound like a, a fat neck, and it is a fat neck, but it's so comfortable. The way uh, Tadio would shave the back of the neck, they you know the shoulders on the back are like very defined, you know, very subtle. So it's a nice grip. Uh, it feels great, and you get a lot of tone because you got a lot of mass in the wood mass in the neck. So. Um, you know this. Um, this is a, another great example of a, uh, of a great year for for a black guard. So here we have, as you can see, you know the finish of this guitar is totally different from that guitar. Not even the color, but how the finish is is, is applied in this buildup. You know, here we have like the desert sand undercoat, which is which is like makes the finish look a lot flatter than than that one. And it's more stable. So, so basically, we have, you know, we have like uh, what they do here. They, they would seal the, the wood, then they would apply the the desert sand, then they would do the blonde, and then they would do a clear coat. So, um, um, so you can play it in Spain. Yeah. I can play it in the summertime, yeah. and um, and somebody played it, you know, because there's a there's a lot of buckle wear here. Um, but it is kind of like what we were talking about, but the blonde finishes from this era. It's kind of like the same principle. Like you get a lot of different shades and a lot of different, it's so three-dimensional. You have different colors here, there, there, there. You know, it's it changes uh, and it's beautiful in that sense. Um, this guitar is, uh, the, the only thing that was changed in this guitar when I got it many years ago was that the fretboard had been planned and uh, it was it had been refretted. So um, the guitar didn't look that right because it had a shiny looking, new looking fretboard. Um, so I, what I did is I added the, uh, the grooves, um, the fingerboard, where, uh, to make it look a little better. But other than that, you know, it's, the frets are perfect. They're a little, they're not the vintage. Uh, size of frets, but they may be like medium. I don't know. I haven't measured them, but um, the pickups are original. The everything under here is original. So it's got the uh, the second generation wiring, which is uh, is not the blend control that that guitar. So um, here you have a tone control. Uh, so you can hear. You know, you have a, a tone control on all three positions, and you, you know, you know, and you you can still combine both pickups if you live the. Uh, the switch in the middle, but it, that's not going to stay. So, so here you have uh, this pickup with with a tone, this this pickup with a tone, and here you have the the cap with the with the neck pickup. Why did the the scratch plates on on these guitars look very different? Was the finishing process different at that point, or you know, again, is that just is that just the wear difference? And we've got a little glare going on. We're going to look at that, and we're going to. Try to... Well, this, you know, Fender, I think Fender was getting phenolic paper from, from whoever was, was making it. And, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that he was getting whatever they would deliver. So over the years, um, it doesn't, you know, some of the phenolic paper that he, they were getting was more of a, uh, uh, plasticky feel and look, you know, it would, it would be more, more uh, of a less of a fiber and more of a plastic. Right. And uh, the first, um, the broadcasters, the, the very first ones from October, 
1950 don't even have a, any lacquer on top. So then, and, and, it's, top it's, and, it, and it's a very different uh, uh, phenolic uh, yeah. paper. Yeah. It's a shiny, it's a very shiny uh, paper. Right. And then on, on this guitar, this is, um, this is very, you know, this is different from that one. And this is, you know, this spot is something that's, you know, kind of hard to replicate and kind of something that you see from that era guitar also. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's got, uh, again, you know, this is paper pressed with, uh, um, um, with some kind of, uh, of, uh, uh, plastic, you know, so it's, uh, it's, they call it, it's a, it's a bake light, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a compressed paper with, uh, oh. uh, so those are the light, the layers you see here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, we have the, the saddles here with the brass, but on this guitar, it's different than that, that, that guitar, because they are notched on the, on the, on the high E and on, on the low E and the high E string, because I, I don't know if you can get that with a camera, but. But in order to get a lower action, Leo would uh, would add a notch on the on the back side of the of the saddle, so you can lower it down further. Hmm. And uh, the knobs are kind of like shorter, and it, they have a different dome shape. This is different too. This is uh, this, like, kind of like the second version. Uh, the broadcaster version, version is open on the top. This is closed. Um, as you can see here, you know, there's a mix of uh, Phillips and, and flathead screws. Uh, the, the, the broadcaster's got all of them are flathead screws, but on this guitar, everything is Phillips, but uh, the switch and... Yeah, the switch. Everything else is Phillips. Um, the tuners are different. This is open shell, uh, no brand. Um, Clusen tuners, which is what came in uh, early, I would say spring of 1952. And uh, yeah, I, um, you know, very similar guitars, but very different guitars. Can you hold both of them right. car carefully or bring them in close? So people can kind of this is this is lighter than this one, yeah. um, they they have different personalities, but they're both great. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, giving us a little uh, his history and a comparison. You know, again, we're we're backstage at a at a at a concert hall in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, it was just such a, a prize to have, you know, these two, you know, cool guitars here. And so I had to take the opportunity to uh, pester Nacho into uh, talking a little bit. So are you still selling the Pinecaster book? Yes, I am. Okay. That is an amazing book that if you have any level of interest, any serious interest in the book, you need to check that out. And that's Pinecaster.com? Yes, sir. Yes. There's Pinecaster book or just Pinecaster? Pinecaster, Pinecaster book. Pinecasterbook.com. Yeah. And Olivier, of course, has hey. lead music in, in Geneva, and we really appreciate him uh, letting us look at his broadcaster. So It's a pleasure, really, right. you know, and we got some hints as well, so that's really interesting. Yes. Really appreciate it. Yeah, he, he gave us a little bit of, a little, he gave away a little bit of the magic. <laughs> just a little bit, but not too much. <laughs> Thank you, Nacho. Thank you. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I need to thank my uh, Patreon members that really make this show possible. You are the best. And uh, if you want to find out more, you can go down in the description. There is a link there. Uh, also, again, I need to thank Nacho and I need to thank uh, Olivier Uldry for uh, you know bringing his uh, broadcaster to the show in Zurich. And, of course, to Brad Paisley for uh, letting me ride on the, uh, <laughs> on the train. So, thanks. Bye-bye.